start off this video real quick. Um, I had a brief time where I was out of hats on the website. Uh, I, hats are available on my website, hvacrvideos.com. Um, but we are back in stock now. Okay. So, um, this is the hat. Uh, it's the hat I'm always wearing, uh, real quick about it. I purposely designed these hats to be specific for our industry. It's a breathable material. It's not a trucker hat, but I can see light through it. It's very breathable. Okay. Black underbill specifically. So that way our fingers, when they're dirty, you touch them. It doesn't show up on the gray hat. It is a flex fit hat. They're available in two sizes, large or small. It's actually large, extra large, small, medium. Um, it purposely has the HVACR acronym on it. So that way it doesn't violate uniform policies, has my color scheme. So uh, if you guys are interested, help support the channel, hvacrvideos.com, hats are available. Now let's get on with the video. This video is brought to you by Sporlin, quality, integrity, and tradition. We're here working on an ice machine and you just got all kinds of problems. It's, it's our first like consistent heat wave. I think I've said that a few times in the videos, but so everybody's really trying to start to realize they got issues. So kitchen AC wasn't working. Someone knocked the thermostat off the wall. I'm sure there might be more going on, but I pushed it back on. It's running. Then I was just walking around triaging the units, just walking by. They're not complaining, but I was just feeling it. This one doesn't feel very hot. There's a big giant ball of ice on the suction line. And pull the filter out. Bam, it's iced up. So that's a nice amount of ice. So I'm gonna set this one up for defrost. And then this one right here, I happen to notice too. Wait, was it this one? Yeah, this one has a big ball of ice on it too. So we're gonna set both. Wait, I think. What was it? I don't know. There might be a it might be one of these. I don't know. One of the other ones has a big ball of ice on it. I think it is this one. So we're gonna check that out. Let's see. I swear. One of these was iced up. This one? Oh yeah, so you guys can't see it, but I can see the suction line in here. You can kind of see it's all iced up. So this one, so both of their bar units are down. So what I'm gonna do, I'm not gonna deal with it tonight. I'm not even bringing it up to their attention. They didn't even ask me. But when I'm here tomorrow, I'm gonna come and go through the kitchen AC. I'll have them create work orders for both of these. I just don't wanna have to deal with this tonight because they're not even complaining yet. Um, what I will do is I will de-ice these real quick. So all I'm gonna do is open this up, put it into, or disconnect the cooling, let the indoor blower motor run and pull the outside air in. So I disconnected the uh, compressor contactor and I'm just gonna leave this door open, pull these filters out and let this guy defrost itself. Hopefully the drain's not plugged up. That's a nice little chunker of ice. Uh, it could be a low charge issue or it could just be, I don't know, we'll see. Uh, drain doesn't look too bad. I've redone this one, obviously. A lot of these drains are all messed up, but this one seems to be fine. It's draining. Yeah, it's draining. So let's move on to the next one. For some reason, look at that. Big old chunkers. Um, look at this guy, though. Good grief. Look at that nameplate. This guy's probably dead. Look at the head of it. Ooh, which one is this? I don't think this one's been running. I think this one's a dead compressor. I don't remember. Looks like maybe. Is that oil? I don't know. Yeah, this guy might be disconnected. Um, still hooked up there. Let's come up here. It still looks like it's in the system. This is my Y1 call, but Y2 is dead. Let me get my meter out. Maybe we're off on uh, lockout. Well, yeah, maybe we're off on lockout. All right, if we come over here from X to C, we get 26 volts, meaning that we're off on compressor lockout for that second stage because the first stage was calling and I disconnected it at the thermostat wire. So, um, yeah, I don't know what's going on with that, but that compressor certainly looks like garbage. That's a bummer. All right, let's see how we're doing on defrosting these coils. Should be moving pretty quick. This one was just the bottom half, leading me to believe that it's like a refrigerant issue. So we'll let that run. Let's go over here and see what this guy looks like. 
shouldn't take long because it's damn near 100 degrees outside. So just get in there. All right, we are back. I actually have someone doing the preventative maintenance today too. So I had him just go over the AC. It was still a little frosted up even after we came back. But we got a nice tight belt. It's been set up for defrost. I, while I had all the panels open, I made sure that the drains are clear. So we're good. I had him disconnect the compressor contactor and let it run for a while again. But this is good now. So we're gonna go ahead and uh, put all the panels back on and we're gonna probe up on it. I uh, got all my stuff right here and we'll see what's going on with it. Oh boy, so I got this guy running. Look at that sub cooling, buddy. Granted that's discharge pressure, but this guy's screaming plugged up fixed orifice metering devices. So super high sub cooling, super high superheat. Head pressure is a little bit lower than it should be, but a six degree evaporator temperature. Yeah, that is not good. So let's come on over here and have a look at this guy. It's running. But yeah, let's open this guy up and see. Oh yeah, metering devices are plugged. You can see them frosting up over there, going in. And because that sub cooling's so high, I don't think that uh, it's gonna be a low charge issue. So, yeah, we've got plugged up metering devices on this guy. Not really much more I can do. It's running, it's gonna ruin the compressor, but I'm gonna have to leave it running because they need something. That's a bummer. Well, I'm gonna start wrapping this one up. I'll get all the information off of it, and then we'll uh, jump onto the other one. All right, I'm probing up on this other unit. This is a, I think it's a 10 ton. I'll find out in a minute. First off, I'll tell you that someone's got the wrong compressors in here. You have a ZR57 and a ZR61. Um, yeah, I don't know. I've seen the previous company to me. I wasn't doing this restaurant in 2017, and uh, they, um, you know what's weird is if you look on all the compressors here, they had a crap ton of compressors all changed at the same time here, which just, that's a whole problem. <laughs> and this customer does good maintenance too. So yeah, anyways, I'm not gonna go any further with that. But um, I'm not even gonna bother doing this one. In fact, I disconnected that compressor. Look at those terminals. Look like they were like condensation or something. I don't know. But the fact all that right there, all that overheating on the top of the head of that compressor, and the discolored sticker, this compressor's ruined. There's no way that the, the insides of that compressor are in any kind of operating shape. And if I try to run it, it's just gonna end up grounding out, I guarantee it. So this compressor's dead. Um, uh, clearly this thing's been overheating for a long time. Melted all the paint off. And then it looks like there's a leak right here because there's oil everywhere. So that guy's dead, but we're gonna definitely try to do this one and see what's going down with that. So I gotta hook it up here in just a minute. I think I've got all my probes on it and I just gotta profile the system and then we'll start it up and see what's going on with this one. This one, R22, it's looking like it's the same thing. High pressure slowly building, but it's kinda looking like it's a plugged up metering device on this one too. So those have the fixed orifice metering devices and I don't care. I've never had good luck cleaning those. And then once you autopsy one, you realize there's a double orifice in there. So it's like almost impossible to clean. But yeah, look at that sub cooling. It's climbing because it's, it's stacking up in the condenser. We'll let it run for a few more minutes, but I'm pretty confident we've got a plugged up metering device on this one too. All right, this guy's just getting worse and worse by the minute. Look at that. That's crazy. Look at that sub cooling. 30 degrees is just getting worse. Um, how in the heck is my suction line 86 degrees right now? Is that really accurate? My liquid line's 80 degrees? Let's go make sure we didn't cross those up, but I don't think we did. Also, uh, you can clearly see the metering device plugged up. See all that frosting, that's not good. Yeah, suction line's right there, so. Oh yeah, that suction line's warm. And liquid line is right here. Oh, I don't know, whatever. That's the right one, but yeah, so this guy's done too, so we're gonna go ahead and take everything off and talk to him about this one too. 
Well, today we've got a big job for this AC. We have an evaporator, two compressors, a drain pan. This guy has got a grounded compressor and then the other one has a plugged up uh, fixed orifice metering device. And, you know, the two compressors that are in there aren't the same compressors. Now the capacity is just slightly off, but still, we're gonna go back with the proper compressors in this guy two new dryers, new evaporator, hopefully get this thing all dialed in. And then we've got to do that one next, but right now, let's focus on this one. Every time we do one of these, there's some sort of damage to the evaporators that we order, even though it's in a pallet. And it's so frustrating, so frustrating, because it has to be in the pallet to get it on the roof, the way that we lift it, so you don't want to uncrate it, but then you open it up. So look at this one. First off, there's this. Now it doesn't, look like it hit the line it just looks like it hit in between so i don't think there's a leak there but this is odd because look right here that's a repair notice how all these other ends have straight tubes and this one has a brazed tube right there that was repaired at the factory that's odd different um the first stage, which is the bottom, or I think that's the first stage, I don't know. This side right here was in a vacuum. This side was not. So frustrating, man. I don't know if this thing has a leak or not. I don't see any damage over here. It looks fine. So it makes me wonder if they didn't vacuum it after they made that repair on the return bend over there. I'm hoping that's what it is, because I don't see any other damage besides that. I don't understand how they can't ship these things correctly. Like. Look at the top of this. Every one of these that I've been getting has been bowed. So that puts pressure on this side of the pipe coming through and on this side, unusual pressure. The other side of the coil doesn't look too bad. There's a couple little dings. This just came out of a pallet. Like, you know, so all this stuff happened at the factory and that's beyond frustrating. It also sucks too, because this has been sitting at my shop for probably two weeks because we picked it up and we didn't have time to do it. And then now we're inspecting it, right? And now we're on a roof. We've already taken it out of the pallet, you know? If I'd have seen this damage from the supply house, I'd have told them, no, I don't want it. But now we're kind of stuck with it, so. Oh, look at that. Yeah. Like, that's a factory. That's ridiculous. That's a factory braze joint. That's like an idiot in the factory that doesn't know what they're doing. I don't even trust that. That's ridiculous. Some people, right? I'm very disturbed and frustrated with that. So I'll probably sand that up, clean it, and reheat it up, get it to actually suck in like it should. It doesn't even look like they really pulled the goober. And I'm not worried about a big goober, because I do that all the time, but it's like, get it to pull in, you know? And I have a feeling that at the factory, they jammed it into something, right? Because that's why they fixed it. Because we don't really want to braze on this right now, we just do a nitrogen regulator and just trying to hold the pipe and spray it with soap bubbles. And we're not seeing anything. So, and we're not hearing anything. Again, that's not a perfect leak test, but I'll just make sure that I sand this up right now and heat this up and get it to pull in better and do a better job of brazing that. And then we're just gonna hope for the best. Got plenty of steel bristle brushes for the drill, this one for the drill, and then for the Milwaukee die grinder tool or whatever, Dremel tool, a couple different ones. So we're gonna get in there and get it all cleaned up, assess it, and then braze it. All right, got it cleaned up as best as possible, all polished up. So we're gonna grab, I put the smallest tip we have, a zero tip. These aren't my torches, but we got a good zero tip in there. And we're gonna heat this guy up and just get the solder to pull in a little bit better. Um, I don't think, like, I don't think it's gonna leak, but it just doesn't look great. So we're gonna make it look, you know, better. I've got some nitrogen flowing through, but before we flowed the nitrogen, we went and blew it out, pressurized it when we were just kind of looking for the leaks to, from each end to make sure there was no debris in there, right? That worries me. And then now I've got the smallest tip I have and we're gonna braise this up real quick. <laughs> mm. 
not my day, huh? Alright, so just gonna slightly heat it. I wouldn't be surprised if it doesn't flare up. Just want to get the solder to flow. There may be enough solder, see it's already flowing. Just gonna get these goobers to pull in. Just getting it, just feathering it, trying to get it to pull back. Remember the solder is going to go where the heat is and I'm going to get rid of the excess solder. There we go. I like that joint a lot better. Now we'll just heat up the bottom, make sure that's nice and good. Put a little solder on there. Cool it off with the oxygen. Remember, we are flowing nitrogen. And I feel much better about that joint. The solder's actually pulled in, like all the way on the bottom, you know? Again, I don't think it was gonna leak where it was at, but it just looked like crud, so got it dialed in a lot better so hopefully that should be good I am just utterly frustrated with this so I polished it up a little bit looked at it but the more I look at this this right here is like it's not a swage joint it's like they just butted this up against it I don't think that's inserted into the pipe because down here I swear it looks like they just put a piece of copper there and brazed it Man, I hope there's no restriction inside this guy right here. But, I mean, it's better than it was. <laughs> you know, it looks like it's sealed, so let's hope there's no leaks. So I was mistaken. Um, I thought this one was grounded, and it's not. It's just a bad compressor. So that kind of makes it a little bit easier on the cleanup process, because I thought it was completely void of refrigerant, and then we would put the gauges on it, and it still has plenty of gas. It's not burnt. We checked it to ground. It's not grounded, so... It's just a bad compressor. But look at the head. You can tell that thing's been overheating. So this one, I know for a fact, the evaporator has restricted metering device in it. And this one, more than likely the same thing. So that's why we're changing the whole evaporator. We're changing both compressors um, and going from there. So we pretty much got the unit apart. We just need to finish recovering the last one. Uh, we can't really pull much out yet, but the whole thing's in pieces. You can clearly see where it's been icing up down at the bottom. All right, well, we're gonna pull the whole condenser too, but again, we gotta wait for that to finish recovering, so. While we're waiting, we got two vacuums going. Get out most of this big stuff. It's not gonna be perfect, you know, this unit's a junker, but at least we can get some of it, some of this stuff going. See, some of it's going down in the ducts though too, so we gotta be careful, but. Just seen right now we just got a big old pocket of oil there must have been shoved in here because we evacuate or we recovered the gas but we pulled it off it shot all that oil out and freaking just blew a smoke cloud all over the roof scared the crap out of us but that's why you're always prepared for this stuff now i know they say don't unsweat things but sometimes you have to so we're just going slow being careful and always be careful too because that oil can ignite especially in the system so flame outs are a real thing and this is where mixing refrigerants and different things can get kind of scary because if you use A2L refrigerants, and, uh, see, yeah, you're going to get a flame out on that too. Something's going on. We got we to gotta pull the core max. Go ahead and stop and let's pull the core max fitting because we're building up pressure. And you know what it is? It's the restriction. The system has a restriction. Even though we pulled it down, we got a buildup. And so when we're trying to undo this one, we're getting a buildup too. So... So we pulled the top off the dryer so that way we can relieve pressure. We pulled the Cormax fitting out, which we had it depressed, but I think still seems like it's getting something. It's weird. Watch out, this might be a... Don't breathe.
All right, let's stop for a sec. I think we need to go ahead and undo the compressor bolts because there's too much tension. This isn't gonna work here. And then pull the compressor? Yeah, probably pull the compressor out of the way to relieve some of the pressure off that guy. Yeah. Now, here's the deal. Why are we unsweating these things? Well, because we don't wanna have to add couplings in different places. So yes, I know it's a good practice to cut lines, but when you're dealing with stuff that's like critically piped and there's not a lot of room in there, it's like, why not just unsweat it so that way it goes right back in? That's why we're doing that. So, but obviously sometimes you have to stop. Like this one, we're still got refrigerant boiling out of the oil and that's a little frustrating, so. All right, let's see if we can double team this. Try not to breathe. Careful, your towel's on fire. Keep eating. No. There we go. Good gosh, was that a difficult thing to get undone. Kind of looks like it broke the line a little bit too. Never easy, right? In hindsight, it probably would have been easier just to cut it, but sometimes we're stubborn, right? Keep moving your torch around. Get around this side, it needs heat. There you go. There you go. All right, moving around the other side. I think you need to increase your flame, but no, not like that. Hold on. Let's relight and let's try again. There we go. Now we can actually get around the pipe. All right. Let that flame curl around. Okay, bring it around this way. Deep inside. Down. There you go. And then just keep it right there. Yeah, it does look like you're running out here. There we go. There we go. We got that off. And last one's up on the top. Alright. Same thing, just kind of bring it around. We are running out, so hopefully we can get this last one. Because then this evaporator can come out. I don't think it's going to work. <laughs> yeah. You're dead. We're done. We'll have to get a new acetylene and oxygen. We have a couple people on this job so we can move through it. Um, Another thing, and it's pretty common on these units, they have zone sensors for the thermostats are down in the ductwork. And this one was run through the compressor section. That's really common on these, and I don't like that. So given the opportunity, I like to move the zone sensors. So we're gonna move it over here, and we'll run it you know, this way around into the where the economizer wire used to go, through here, and then down into here, and we'll drop it down that way. So I'm gonna get some thermostat wire, but I pulled out the old stuff. It was connecting right here that good um, and we're just working on getting everything undone we'll get the evaporator out in a minute now in the bigger evaporators I tend to find that most of the time you don't have to cut them on the smaller evaporators every one that I've done the metals too wide and the copper lines hit the side of the unit in there so I'm hoping we don't have to cut this one and it looks like I still got to get some screws out of there too got the evaporator out we got to be very careful but we're gonna pull the drain pan out right now whenever we do these we change the drain pan because it's a lot easier than when the evaporators in there and these drain pans they always crack when the fiberglass gets old so we're gonna swap that out then start building it back with the evaporator Take a couple people, we'll get it put back in. It's not like the other ones because if you look, it's like it's. I don't know, we're gonna play with it some more, but I think I'm gonna have to cut it because it's hitting the lines all on the sides right there, and I don't want it to hit. So I'm gonna try again to see if I can pop it into place, but I think we're gonna have to cut this piece, which I've had to do on the smaller ones where you cut a straight line down the middle. That stinks.
take the inside lip all the way down and all the way up off and it'll it'll work. We got this die, uh, whatever you want to call this. Alright, I cut a good chunk off of both sides, so hopefully it fits now. Alright, so that is much better. It actually like clears now and doesn't hit, so we ran it all the way down each side. So I'm glad I cut both sides. It's all screwed in. We sanded this up. So we're going to get ready on doing the suction line, piping to the compressors, and do all that. And then we'll put the condenser in last. All right, we are going to braze in this section right here. To, we're putting a suction dryer in and braze this. We are purging with nitrogen. Um, and we've got the Viper wet rag, the heat blocking compound by Refrigeration Technologies on here to try to help from burning everything up. So we'll do that part and then we'll do the other suction line and then we'll put in the condenser and you know doing all that other stuff so a little bit out of time all right we're just getting fitted for the second one now we often will use props and different things because everything wants to move right so we've got some nitro flowing again more the viper wet rag on this one this guy's all done and in right suction line we haven't done any liquids or discharges um oh yeah that's right we got to pull this cap off because we want to relieve the pressure now we're just using a tiny bit of nitrogen it's on the braze function and it's just slowly moving through the lines just to make sure we do our best to clean everything up you know and protect it as much as possible so we're going to start with this one because this is kind of a cruddy joint we ended up cutting it short because it had uh, broken when we were trying to unsweat it but it all worked out um, it worked out because we ended up putting a suction filter in filter dryer so we ended up cutting the line shorter and we were able to make up that difference when we cut the suction line, if you're very careful about it. All right, let's get to braze. Okay, we got the compressor in, cooled. So now we're just gonna do this dryer real quick over here and then this last one. So we're doing it in baby steps. It only makes our life a lot easier. Okay, and so over here, while that's being brazed in, we've got the evaporator filter rack back together. We'll throw the filters in right now. We got the whole side panel back on. You gotta be really careful with these because there's a bunch of screws, right? And they go right between the copper tubes. So you don't wanna use like a long screw. You gotta use the right screw. So we're gonna put a couple more screws in there. Drain pan's all good. We'll definitely be running some water in it and flush out the big chunkies. We tried to vacuum as much as possible as we were going. So this is all back together, back in here. It's really important to get these screws back in. Those are tricky screws. There's that cruddy spot but I think we're gonna be okay so yeah we're moving along everything's looking good so far getting ready to put this condenser back in but we're gonna give it a rinse it's not really dirty but we're still gonna give it a quick little rinse before but we got to be careful not to get water so we put some caps on the dryers and then we'll get it over there and get it all brazed in prepping the condenser now we got the old dryers pulled out um, I think it goes like this I straighten everything out We'll secure everything there. You can see that there's some goobers and stuff from solder, but that's okay, guys. It doesn't have to be perfect. That's just from excess solder because trying to braze these things in place, it can be difficult, you know? So it is what it is. I mean, you know, yeah, it may look ugly, but it's not the end of the world. Now, if if it was on a braze joint not pulled in, like on the evaporator, that's when I get concerned. But if it's just from someone just trying to braze a dryer upside down, it's not a big deal. And then when I go to do the, this over here, we gotta switch the brazing to this. Okay. We may even be okay where we're at, to be honest with you. I'll probably have to have you like push that when I braze this one. But I'm gonna do this one yeah, first. first. So where are we connected? Good. Right here. torches in through here.
you give me my lineman pliers? I can't see. Yeah. Plenty of heat. Yeah. Let me get rid of that big old pimple. Ow. Good over here. Okay, what's next? Uh, get that discharge line moved. This one. This one? Yep. Just uh, position it out of the way. I'll do the dryer real quick. Which should be this one right here, right? Uh, ba -ba -ba -ba. Go get vacuum pump, Robert, from my van, and uh, extension cord and true blue hoses. I already got an extension cord. Already. Okay, so true blue hoses, vacuum pump, um, and we're gonna need Will's vacuum pump too. We'll do two of them. Yeah, we'll do two. Let's go down with them. Then. Does yours have a double for the extension cord? Yeah. Okay. Do you want me to go down? I, can go I want you to hang just for a second. Let me make sure I don't need your help. Solder. Is that pulling down? Yeah. All the way around? Yeah, we're good. Okay. You didn't open up right here? Put a little in that corner. 
There you go. Okay? Look decent? Okay. So we got that guy. Top of the dryer. So now we need to switch the nitro over to the other side. Um, where are we going to put the nitro on this one? Put it. Well, I guess this is not up yet. That's why I was like confused. this is because there's more rigidity there and you're more or less just pushing no no I would, I would do it back here but you're just pushing is all you're doing dude yeah. you're not even holding so just keep pressure
All right, everything is brazed in. I think so. Uh, we did a lot of stuff. We ended up adding liquid line ports. By having those, we can get a true sub cooling, and also it gives us the ability to pull a true evacuation, not having to use the high flow Schrader cores. We went ahead and replaced the high flow Schrader cores, the Cormax fittings. Uh, so we'll be able to pull down on the suction line filter dryer and the liquid line port. Um, everything's good. I'm gonna hang in here until we do a pressure test just to make sure in case I gotta braze anything. But we're just kind of in cleanup mode and then we gotta fix all the thermos, I mean the uh, pressure control wires that I cut and all that good stuff. All right, we went ahead and did a pressure test. Didn't see anything wrong with the pressure test. So now uh, we're doing evacuation. We're gonna take lunch. And, um, well, two of us are gonna take lunch. One person already did. That sounds really loud, why? Probably because I have the gas ballast open. I'll have to look into that, that's a little funky. But um, yeah, we're uh, just letting the vacuum run now. So we've got micron gauges over here. All right, the evacuation is done. Um, everything's looking good, no big problems. So we're gonna start unhooking that. We're assembling the unit. We ran the new zone sensor over here. And uh, we're gonna start getting ready to charge this guy up. Um, I've got about six pounds of gas in this one. We are using the recovered R22, but we're running it through a filter dryer just to be safe. Um, yeah, so we're just about done. This one takes something like nine pounds. So we're putting it in through the high side, letting it take, as it looks like it might be taking about as much as it can, and we may have to switch over to the other side. We're currently wiring up the pressure switches that I disconnected, and then we gotta wire up the compressors, and then we can do the startup. All right, got the compressors wiring cleaned up and got them wired in where I think it should be. Um, we got the, con the pressure controls all connected back in. Uh, we need to check phase rotation now. So we have our indoor blower motor. I disconnected compressor contactors and the indoor blower contactor by pulling the coil voltage. So when I turn this on, nothing should theoretically turn on. Let's see if that's accurate though. Let me see if I can get this to go in there. There we go. And uh, see what happens. Okay, nothing's on. Now what we need to do is just bump the blower contactor. And it's going in the wrong direction, I think. Wait, we didn't change the blower though. No, that's the right direction, yeah. So blower's good, but we never changed anything with the blower contactor, that's right. But what we do need to do is because we had the unit off, they have customers in the building now. So we need to bump that by hand and have someone downstairs on the phone with me letting me know if there's dust blowing out. But the next thing, let's go ahead and bump the compressors. They both sound decent. I don't really see any problems with the way that they sound, so they don't sound like they're going in the wrong direction or anything. So, okay, we're gonna finish putting it together. We're gonna bump the contactor for the blower, and then after that, we'll, uh, we'll fire it up and test all the stages. We gotta finish charging this one. This one takes another two or three pounds of gas. So this one took the whole charge. All right, this is looking pretty darn good. So we got both of them charged to the factory charge. Um, we are running lower than normal pressures, and obviously I have a panel pulled off right now, right? But it's also 64 degrees outside right now. So we don't have a very big load inside the building. I have it jumped out with both compressors running, but it's looking great. Saturation temperature's low, right? But that's gonna happen right now. This one's pretty low too. This one's at 33. And it it's a fixed orifice metering device, so it takes a few minutes for the pressures to build up. Notice, look at, we're rising right now. These things always do this. They start out low and then they slowly start to build up once the, um, condenser loads up and everything so we're looking good so far we're gonna let it keep running um, and we'll probably probe up with the job link probes and start cleaning up all our messes so this particular job um, we've got a bunch of trash over here we have an evaporator we have two compressors we're actually gonna be coming back for that because we have another job for that little AC right there where we got to do the same thing evaporator compressor it's a whole thing so we gotta come back another day, lift up the equipment for that other AC, we'll take down this equipment, um, but we'll just clean it up so that way there's not a big mess up here. And we're looking pretty good so far, so condensers, you know, pretty beat down. You know, in a perfect world they changed this unit, but we couldn't get a 10 ton unit right now. Just can't find them, so. Right now, I just turned it on about two minutes ago, so it really hasn't stabilized out too much yet. But so far, we are getting an accurate, true subcooling reading because I added liquid line pressure ports, okay? So circuit one does not look too bad. Now notice our saturation temperature is low. It is gonna build 
but also there's not a very big load in the building. Notice that we're within range, right? Because there's not a huge load, okay? So we scroll over. I mean, it's 63 degrees outside and it's 64 degrees return air. So it's there's no load, right? So that's expected. Temperature splits about 22 degrees, so that doesn't seem too bad, okay? Let's scroll over to the second stage. Second stage, subcooling still kind of high, but we're gonna give it some time to stabilize out again. Um, and it's dropping slowly. So we're gonna let it run for a little bit longer, but I mean, it's not scaring the heck out of me yet. Airflow seems about where it should be. It's a 10 ton unit. Delivered capacity is within range. So yeah, we're looking good. We're just gonna let it run for a bit. So at this rate, we're gonna have to wait till it's a little bit warmer outside because we have no load. My saturation temperature just keeps dropping. We're at 28 degrees, but we're looking good as far as subcooling and stuff goes. So yeah, I'm not too worried about everything. Super heat's a tad on the high side, but again, we'll analyze everything later, but it's like night and day. I mean, both compressors are running. They're gonna be a-okay, super stoked. And like I said, the temperature split across the unit is decent, yeah. Um, they, I will say one thing too, is I'm pretty sure that our return air grill downstairs is really dirty because I was looking down through the ducts and it looks like it's real dirty. So we'll definitely have to address that on a PM or something too. But that's pretty much gonna be it for this one. I mean, there's not too much more we can do, especially when we don't have a load on this building and it's so cold outside. It's weird how two weeks ago it was in the 90s and now it's 60 something degrees outside. Kind of crazy, but polishing a turd, right? It's better than it was and uh, it'll probably last another summer. All right, let's wrap it up. We'll hand the keys to the customer and we'll catch you on the next one. That one was a long time coming. That AC had been down for quite a long time and this was uh, done, let's see, it is now February 28th of 2023. This video was filmed, I think back in September of 2022. So um, it took a while to get all the parts, the evaporator and stuff for this unit. Um, took a couple months to get it, you know, shortages and all that stuff. And you know, I know a bunch of people are gonna be asking, why did I use R22? Why didn't I use an alternative? Okay, right off the bat, this last summer, I started using 407C. I do a lot of these carrier package units. I did actually probably five or six of these identical repairs where I'm changing evaporators because the fixed orifice metering devices were plugged up and you know all that stuff, right? So I did several of them where I used a 407C and I ran into a lot of problems. Now, I realize it's probably just to do, in fact, I know it has to do with the fixed orifice metering device and the high ambient temperatures. But for some reason, when we get above 110 degrees ambient, the, the 407C, the way that it operates, this unit falls flat on its face. We start blowing fuses on the unit because it runs high current under heavy load situations, okay? Uh, now, as far as charging the unit with 407C, I charge to target superheat, just like I did on this one. Well, actually this one I waited in, but you use target superheat because it's a fixed orifice metering device and obviously pay attention to all the other vitals. But I ran into a lot of issues. So this was the last one of the year that I did these big repairs on, actually second to last one. And we decided to use, go back with R22. So we cleaned up the R22 from the operating compressor and then we had uh, other R22 that we used for the other compressor in here, okay? Now, um, just because it is, you know, that's what works best in these units. Now, I have used 407C in several units with TXVs. Works just fine, no problems. But something about the fixed orifice metering devices, when it gets above 105, 110 degrees, these units start blowing main fuses, and they just run really high current. They run perfect, you know, when it's below 100 they run perfect all day long. They're great. But to make it through the summer on several of them that I did the conversions on, I had to run misting devices just to get through the rest of the summer. And then as we come into the next uh, spring slash summer, we may have to go back in with R22. Now, I'm not a huge fan of using alternative refrigerants. It took me a long time to start using 407C. And then I even ran into problems with these ones. So it is what it is. I realize some people love different um, alternatives to R22. I personally don't believe any of the, the stuff that the manufacturers tell you of those refrigerants where you don't have to do oil changes and stuff. I will argue to my death that if you go into the manufacturer's installation instructions of all those different refrigerants that they say you don't have to use polyester oil with, 
in the fine print, it says in certain situations, it's going to be best to use polyester oil. Okay. In one way or another, they're going to say that in the fine print because they themselves know that, yeah, they can add a hydrocarbon to their refrigerant to make it work a little bit better. But in certain situations, it's still best to use polyester oil. To me, that means if you are going to use an alternative, always use polyester oil. Don't mess with the mineral oil, the trying to convert using all these different refrigerants. I'm just not into it. Okay. So it is what it is. Now, uh, we went ahead and basically rebuilt this unit because we could not get a replacement unit at the time. We were having a hard time finding the 10 ton package units. Okay. So we went ahead and put a new evaporator because the fixed orifice metering devices were plugged up. Now I know there's going to be a bunch of people out there saying, how come I didn't clean the fixed orifice metering devices? There's a method and I've tried it. I may even have it on film or something, but there's a method where what you do is you pressurize one side of the system with really high pressure nitrogen. And then the idea is, is that you heat up the fixed orifice metering device. And I guess the theory is, is that you're going to melt whatever waxy buildup is inside of there and it's going to push through the system. I've tried it and I personally have not had good experiences with it. Okay. It's never really worked right. Then what I did was one time, and I have it on video too, I took one of these evaporators after I got done changing it and I cut out the fixed orifice metering device and I found out something that blew my mind. In the fixed orifice or the accurator metering device for this particular carrier package unit, there's actually two orifices, literally right next to each other, two orifices. So the refrigerant goes through one orifice, then it goes into a little cavity, then it goes through another orifice, two separate orifices in this, in each accurator metering device in this unit. So this has a liquid header on it and it has like 15 or 20 different circuits, right? Going off of it. Each one of those has two fixed orifice metering devices in it. So let's think about this. If the theory is that we're going to heat this up and put high pressure nitrogen on one side and we're going to blow out whatever's inside that metering device. Once it goes through one orifice, you're going to have some sort of a pressure drop and then it's going to have to go through another orifice. The odds of you pushing something through the system through two orifices is dang near impossible. Then on top of that, let's think about what usually causes these metering devices to plug up. And usually in my situation, it's not from brazing. It's just from poor maintenance on the equipment, overheated oil that is just lined the walls of the liquid line and it starts to restrict the metering device. Sometimes there's sediment and stuff, but majority of the time it's just bad oil that's been overheated that's just flowing through the system and it's just causing issues, okay? So personally, I don't see any good, I don't have any good luck with trying to clean these fixed orifice accurate metering devices. More power to you if you can do it but I just don't see it. So I'd rather just change the evaporator. They also make, you can order just the liquid header, but really when these evaporators are as trashed as they are, why not just order an evaporator? The customer's paying for it. I quoted it with a new evaporator, lift up the evaporator, put it in, be done with it, right? And then no questions asked. So went ahead and changed the evaporator, put all the dryers and necessary stuff on the equipment. When we started it up, it was kind of cool outside in the 60s. So the system seemed to be operating pretty decent, but we had low load conditions. Um, you know, we really haven't had any complaints. Uh, we did have some more heat waves after that, and the customer was super stoked with how the unit had been working. But other than that, that's it. We did our best. Um, I appreciate you guys making it to the end of the video. Thank you so very much. I mentioned at the beginning of the video that hats are now available again on the website. If you guys are interested, go to my website, hvacrvideos.com. Great way to support the channel. The easiest way to support the channel, is simply watch the videos from beginning to end. That's the easiest way. Other ways to support the channel, if you're interested in purchasing any tools, truetechtools.com. You can use my offer code, big picture, one word, and on majority of their items, you'll get an 8% discount. And when you use my offer code, I actually get a small commission. So they send me an affiliate payout based off of how many purchases happen with my offer code, big picture. So that's another great way to help support the channel. You can also support the channel via PayPal, Patreon, and YouTube channel memberships. Those are all monthly commitments that you make. Well, actually, PayPal is not. But YouTube channel memberships and Patreon, those are monthly commitments. Um, PayPal is just a donation kind of a thing. So anyways, there's links in the show notes if you're interested in supporting them. Thank you so very much. Remember to be kind to one another, and uh, we will catch you on the next one, okay?